you for having me and for the warm introduction. Uh, it's a very nice workshop. I have to compliment the way it's organized. This is really great. I wish the light cone meetings were done this way rather than packing in huge numbers of talks. Speaking of which, here is a URL for the next light cone meeting <laughs> at Jefferson Lab in Virginia, uh, which is not uh, nearly as cold as Minnesota, so you shouldn't be afraid to go there. Um, so check out that site if you're interested. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is to try to touch on some uh, things associated with the main idea for light front type calculations, which is to solve QCD in a way that's complementary to the way the lattice people do it. And the idea is to be able to get at wave functions and be able to stay within Minkowski space. Um, so in order to be able to do that, we really usually think in terms of Fox space uh, expansions for uh, solving the problem, solving the Hamiltonian problem. And there are various issues that come up in trying to do that. Uh, this is a review article that I wrote um, a couple years ago that for any of the details, working on a board talk, I'm not going to be doing lots of, throwing lots of details at you really fast. Instead, I'll just be talking about things in general. Uh, the few details I wanted, wanted to be able to point out, I've already put on the board here. Um, but the key issues that we have to encounter in trying to attack QCD have to do with gauge fixing, and a typical situation in light front, you, they choose light cone gauge. Um, Sophia and I are considered heretical within the light cone community, so uh, we prefer to do things in terms of a covariant gauge. And we're able to do that because of a particular choice of regularization that we make. Uh, that, of course, is just a general issue when you're trying to do uh, gauge theories in 3 plus 1. There's also just the issue of numerics, how to do numerical calculations. I wanted to talk a little bit about that since uh, the bulk of my work uh, over the years has really been focused on numerical calculations. And for many people, they tend to focus on that as being the key issue. But that isn't what's really holding things back as far as being able to attack QCD. The time will come when that's an issue. And there are certainly methods to be brought to bear. But the real, these other issues are actually more important as far as making true progress. Another issue that's already come up at this workshop several times is this notion of Fox space truncation and what that does to your calculation. And of course, it has some nasty effects associated with regularization and associated with the gauge. And I'll uh, talk about the approach that we have in mind for handling that. Uh, another open issue that we're just now looking at in the last couple of years is to focus more on what do you do about the vacuum. On the light front, the vacuum is trivial, <laughs> but that's actually a very naive statement. Where do zero modes sit in the calculation? How do you interpret vacuum effects? And that's what has brought us back to 5.4. You know, I've done calculations in 5.4 over the years in, in, with various uh, intentions, but we're once again back to that. And uh, the very nice work that's been done now in equal time gives us a, an even better target as trying to understand where's the physics on the light front compared to what you see in equal time. And that will be a, a big focus of the next talk that Sophia will give. But I, I'm going to say a few things about that as well if time permits. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, so to look at how we're thinking in terms of resolving each of these issues. As far as the gauge fixing is concerned, that for us is tangled up with the issue of how we're going to regulate the theory. We're talking about doing, uh, regulating a non-perturbative theory. And that means that something like dimensional regularization doesn't work because you have to go in there with every integration that's being done and tweak it. But in a non-perturbative calculation, that sort of thing is just buried within your matrix diagonalization process. And so it's not something that is very readily done. We have to look at it from a, some different perspective. And the, what we've been doing, uh, although I've flirted a bit with doing a supersymmetric situation where you introduce <coughs> partners that will not be 
physical, so it's not the real supersymmetry that they're looking for at the LHC. This is just using the technology of supersymmetry to introduce partners that would provide the necessary cancellation, and then you break the supersymmetry to lift those partners out of the physics that, that you're interested in. So that would be one approach, and we did, have done various, I've done various calculations with uh, Steve Pinsky uh, doing supersymmetric Yang Mills. I'll talk about that a little bit um, as I go along. But our main focus has been on using polyvalars. Now that's not polyvalars in the usual way. That's not subtracting loops, but instead subtracting within propagators. And so we introduce the fields in Lagrangian and use those to cancel things. Uh, so in any loop, you get two subtractions rather than one because you're subtracting on both of the, the lines in the loop. So for example, if you have a, a gluon loop like this, the subtraction would not be that you put a polyvalars all the way around here and then subtract that from the original, but instead you have four different things. You have a polyvalars here, regular here, polyvalars here, regular here, all regular, or all polyvalars, all four of those things, and then combine in such a way that you get two subtractions. That corresponds to putting the polyvalars particle in the Lagrangian all the way from the beginning. And that means in the numerical calculation, you will have those additional polyvalars particles in the calculation too. So it makes the calculation bigger, which makes the numerics more challenging. Um, and the uh, reason that we're interested in doing things in this sort of way is that for maintaining gauge invariance, there is a way, once we include the polyvalars particles, to be able to quantize in a covariant gauge. We're not restricted to light cone gauge the way normal light front calculations are. The downside, of course, is you have to bring in unphysical degrees of freedom, you have to bring in ghosts and all that sort of stuff, but we feel that's an important price to pay because if you do a calculation that disobeys symmetries, if I can get to show it. Can you put on the projector? Yeah. This is a calculation that we did in QED, uh, Sophia and I, uh, that is truncated to just one photon, but we're including polyvalar's photons to regulate the theory. This is in 3 plus 1, of course. Um, and the horizontal axis there is the mass of the polyvalar's photon and the different curves correspond to different polyvalars electrons in the calculation. And you can see that you have to drive the polyvalars mass up to very high levels in order to get rid of the dependence on, I'm oh, sorry, I forgot to say, this is the anomalous moment of the electron, rescaled to the Schringer value. Um, you get a huge dependence on the cutoff unless you're out at a very large momentum, which of course would cause a lar very large mass, which of course would cause all sorts of problems if you're doing a numerical calculation. You want to be able to calculate at some reasonable cutoff value, not something that's approaching infinity. <laughs> and this all happens because we've broken a symmetry in the theory. We've broken the chiral symmetry that occurs when the mass of the electron goes to zero. By inserting a second polyvalar's photon, we're able to restore that symmetry, and once you do that, this heavy dependence on the uh, regulating mass goes away. So we feel it's very important to be able to have gauge invariance, at least at the level that you say that in terms of perturbation theory, where you do a covariant gauge with an arbitrary gauge parameter and check that you're independent of that gauge parameter. And one calculation that we did, oops, wrong direction, sorry. Um, one calculation that we did, again, in QED, looking at the anomalous moment of the electron in an arbitrary covariant gauge, the zeta is the gauge parameter. The zeta equals zero is a singular limit, so there we get huge dependence on zeta. But generally speaking, it's uh, relatively flat. There are, there's violations there still. It's not perfectly flat, but that's associated with the Fox space truncation, as far as we understand it. Um, but as far as just doing a calculation with an arbitrary gauge, we're essentially independent 
uh, up modulo those Fox based truncation problems. So we want to be able to extend that sort of thing to a non abelian theory, meaning QCD. And our proposal for doing that is what's written here. This, uh, at least, this is the starting point. Okay, there is additional stuff that has to be added on. But the base Lagrangian for QCD, these k indices refer to summing over, for k equals 0, it would be the physical one. All the higher values of k would correspond to polyvalars, uh, gluons. Same for i, they would correspond for i1 and higher would be polyvalars quarks. And then the interaction between the quarks and the gluons. And of course, you have self-interactions of the gluons built into this field tensor. But this field tensor is constructed not quite the usual way. These fields are summed over all the available fields. And they are arranged in just such a way with these coefficients, such that these fields are what uh, we call null, satisfy this, this constraint right here. The commutator of the creation and annihilation operators associated with this field, which are linear combinations of these, this A with this A dagger commute, you get zero. They're actually a, a null metric. And the way that's achieved is that these RKs are the metric of the individual uh, field. So for example, the commutator for the field with the kth index would be proportional to rk. And rk is either equal to plus or minus 1. So for a negative metric field, the, that would mean that you're, ins you're inserting rk values of minus 1. And you can see it shows up here. In order to maintain a positive kinetic energy associated with the polyvalar's field labeled by K. So this structure is what lets us insert a polyvalar's particles into QCD as fields within the calculation. The gauge, the gauge invariance of this Lagrangian fails for an ordinary gauge transformation. And that's because of the way this interaction is structured. This interaction allows for what we call flavor changing, meaning changing from one polyvalars uh, to another um, or between a physical and a polyvalar. So when you go to this kind of a graph, for example, at this vertex, you might have an ordinary, part, ordinary gluon coming in, but this could be coming out as a polyvalars gluon and this coming out as either polyvalars or not. Uh, and this could be uh, not polyvalars. So you have all the possibilities happening here, and that's what this sum represents in the calculation. That sort of thing messes up the gauge invariance for an ordinary gauge transformation. The other thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to introduce a mass for the polyvalars gluons in order to be able to remove them from the spectrum. And that would also, in general, if you do it just explicitly, would also mess up the gauge invariance. But as far as fixing this problem of mixing the fields, we generalize the gauge transformation to itself involve mixing. So this term does not involve just the kth polyvalar's particle, but involves this null field, this A without the index. And so the gauge transformation itself also mixes and it mixes also with respect to the gauge function here. This lambda without the index is a sum over all the different lambdas associated with the individual particles. So if you extend the definition of the gauge transformation for the gluon field and do a similar thing for the quark field, where again, this psi is this null combination, then this Lagrangian is gauge invariant. Not only that, but the combined field, this null field, is abelian. It obeys an abelian gauge transformation, simply because of these constraints. If you then rewrite this Lagrangian it looks like this. Where we have a term for a massless vector particle, and we have a term for 
mass degenerate quarks. I also have to worry about splitting the mass degeneracy for the quarks. We have this uh, three gluon interaction, and we have the quark gluon vertex here. All of these interactions involve only the null combinations, and because of that, you get all the necessary sub uh, double subtractions on any loops. You get the subtraction, uh, subtraction on the, the propagator, and so it's essentially equivalent to using higher derivative, higher order derivative as a regulator uh, in the original Lagrangian. So, yeah, pardon? I was just about to thank you for bringing that up. The quartic terms <coughs> disappear, okay? When you go from writing it in this form, where you would expect that because the field tensor has a, a quadratic dependence that you would then have quartic dependence, but they actually disappear from the Lagrangian. They cancel out because of those constraints and the way the Lagrangian is structured. The way that physics comes back in is that we've basically taken that local four-point gluon interaction and made it non-local, mediated by a poly gluon. Which have what mass? The poly gluons, what is their mass? Well, I have to add terms to the Lagrangian to give them mass, but the mass is something that is tunable, okay? And we would drive it to high values to remove them from the spectrum. But are you not... And it's in the limit, it's in the limit that that polyvalar's gluon goes to high mass that this, with this being polyvalar's here, this then reduces down to the local interaction of four ordinary gluons. So we re recover the quadratic interaction that's in the original QCD Lagrangian in that limit. But, but your poly Villars mass, I guess, is going to preserve this new gauge invariance? Or no, I have to introduce the poly Villars mass by adding another term to this Lagrangian in a way that does not break the gauge invariance. And what we first thought we might do is use a Higgs mechanism to do that. But it turns out that if you try to construct the Higgs type of theory with this 5-4 interaction for null fields, everything has to be null for all the interactions, then you, it's ill-defined as far as finding a symmetry breaking point for that Higgs field. And not only that, but even if we succeeded in doing that, the massless mode of the, in the gluon sector would be one of these null combinations. It would not be the physical gluon that would be massless. And so that, that is unacceptable. But there's an alternative way um, of introducing an interaction with a scalar that has a, that maintains gauge invariance modulo the fact that it's tangled up with the gauge fixing term. So the gauge fixing term depends both on the gluon field and the scalar field. But once you add those terms to the Lagrangian, you have a gauge fixed Lagrangian in a covariant gauge with a gauge parameter, just like I was talking about earlier. And you have um, gauge invariance up to the point of having fixed the gauge, okay? So you have this, uh, just the, the only remnant is gauge parameter. Beyond that, you can add ghost fields and establish a BRST symmetry for the theory. And the only th nasty thing that happens there, besides the fact that you're adding lots of fields, is that the interaction of the ghost fields has to be non-local in order to be able to satisfy all the ways that things are, are uh, coupled here. And you know that as, the, as you renormalize the theory that form of the non-local interaction is preserved somehow, or? That the, the renormalization of the theory is still an open question, okay? The, the proposal is that with this structure, if we've, got, if we've maintained a BRST symmetry, that it gives a, a handle to be able to attack the theory and, and establish that the, the renormalization works. That, that is what we've been uh, putting together, okay? Um, so 
The other thing, those of you who've done life run, if you've done any life run calculations or looked at them, there's something called instantaneous fermion interactions, which is another uh, four point thing. And those also are split into a non local um, interaction mediated by a polyvalars and recover the original in the, in the massive limit for that. John, if I may mention, I think there are only two or three people in this room who have ever done light runs. Okay, well, I can ignore that comment then. <laughs> Noth nothing that I've said so yeah, far. I'm curious about it, but we are very ignorant. <laughs> and nothing I've said so far is actually specific to the light front um, in, in talking about this Lagrangian. But of course, our intent is to, to use it in a, in a light front calculation. Um, oh, and also for the uh, massive gluons, in order to be able to quantize them, there is a method due to Stuckelberg, which is a generalization of the Gupta Bloiler. And you have to have the four polarizations, the physical two and the unphysical two. And you give a negative metric to the scalar polarization, or rather the opposite metric. Because if you're dealing with a negative metric polyvalars, you have to give it that scalar polarization a positive metric. And the, the generalization for working in an arbitrary gauge as opposed to Feynman gauge is that the mass associated with that polarization has to be different. It becomes gauge dependent. But everything else still goes through um, in structuring the theory. Now, um, for numerics, um, we've been doing, I've done lots of calculations using the Lansosh method, and in particular, done um, Yukawa in 3 plus 1, and we've gone up to about uh, 60 million states. And this is with a polyvalar's regularization built in. And that means that we have an indefinite metric. Because we have these negative metric polyvalar's particles built in there. And so you don't have a Hamiltonian that is Hermitian. It is self-adjoint with respect to a um, transformation that takes into account the fact that there's an indefinite metric here. And Which theory are you considering? Well, I'm just saying that done calculations in Yukawa 3 plus 1. But this theory is not that simple free, so it does not exist. Well, you can do... So you don't expect a well-defined continuum linear thing. We do it within the restriction that there's only one fermion, and we're looking at the dressing of that fermion, okay? And so you can do the calculation in various ways and, and compare. Um, but in any case, what I'm, I'm talking about the, the technology required to do that kind of calculation, there is a, a method that I developed. Um, you have to use a, a special algorithm related to the basic Lansosh algorithm that takes into account this indefinite metric. And we can handle things in the way that you would normally do for an ordinary symmetric Hamiltonian matrix. But these are done with a method that's called, uh, by the acronym of DLCQ, discrete light cone quantization. We're dealing with coordinates that are on the light cone and putting that in a box. And that means that the, corris the uh, corresponding momentum component that is conjugate to this x minus coordinate, the t minus z coordinate, this, this x plus is e plus pz, that because of the restriction to the box and periodic boundary conditions, this is then restricted to being a multiple of pi over L. And so you discretize the whole problem. The key eigenvalue problem that you're trying to solve takes this form, where this is the result you get for the total 
momentum, P squared being M squared, and this being P um, plus times P minus, and um, minus P perp squared. <laughs> so the P minus, which corresponds to the being conjugate to the light cone time x plus, that is what propagates things forward in time. That's the key Hamiltonian that you want to uh, diagonalize. And you do so within a basis which, is, which are eigenstates of P plus and of P perp. And the eigenvalue of P minus takes this form. It's quite common to do the calculation where you've multiplied through by P plus and cancel this off and to work in a frame where P perp is zero, so that part is gone as well. So now it looks much more like what you might have expected, where you have an operator on the state, gives you m squared times the state. And so you expand this in a Fock basis that has occupation for these different momentum values for whatever your uh, fields are that, that you're representing within this state. And you then form a matrix representation that's associated with this discretization, and you diagonalize that matrix in some way. And they are typically quite large, and so you have to use Lansosh techniques. And if you're <coughs> dealing with polyvalars, then you have to do this special algorithm that takes into account the indefinite metric. Now, I wanted, in, wanted to also mention that for Lansosh, the, the way that works is it gives you this tridiagonal representation. We've already heard this earlier this week. It gives you a tridiagonal representation of the original matrix that is a small tridiagonal matrix. You diagonalize that, and the eigenvalues, the extreme eigenvalues, are close to the eigenvalues of the original matrix. What is perhaps less well known is that the intermediate eigenvalues in that Lansosh matrix give you a representation of the density of states of uh, the system. And so you can do calculations of things like correlation functions by inserting a sum of uh, the decomposition of the identity using the output from that Lansosh calculation rather than having to do a full exact diagonalization of your original matrix. And some of the calculations we've done that way were in uh, super what is called supersymmetric DLCQ. And there, the idea is to quantize the supercharge and then calculate the structure of the P minus Hamiltonian, the light cone Hamiltonian, from that supercharge. And this is not equal to the P minus you would get from taking a DLCQ approximation to the P minus of the theory. And so you can calculate, you can do a calculation in a supersymmetric theory where the supersymmetry is exactly preserved. It's not violated by the numerics. If you do it in ordinary DLCQ, you get violations of the supersymmetry that are associated with the, uh, the box size, basically. So by doing calculations in that way, we can handle supersymmetric theories. And we looked at uh, correlator of stress energy for a couple theories, one of which had a um, duality with a supergravity theory, and one that does not. So for the two, this 2-2 two, two theory, this is in, in one dimension, uh, one plus one dimensions, supersymmetric theory reduced from a higher number of dimensions, which then brings in uh, additional fields. So you've got either 2-2 two, two combination or 8-8 eight, eight combination. On the left uh, is for the 2-2, two, two, and on the right it's for the 8-8. Eight, eight. What you're looking at is a... Which are these theories, 2, 2, 8, 8? The... The 8, 8, 
no, the only important point is that for the 8-8, there is a duality that exists that predicts what, based on a weak coupling calculation in supergravity, what the dependence of this correlator should be on R, which is a measure of this separation between the two points in the correlator. And at very short separations, it's supposed to go like 1 over R to the fourth, and that R to the fourth behavior has been removed. So the zero that's up there on the left corresponds to the very short distance behavior that uh, you na naively expect. As you go to larger R, it's supposed, for 8,8, eight, it's supposed to go to 1 over R to the fifth, which corresponds to the minus 1. And our calculation falls apart when we soon get past the place where it does reach minus 1. Whereas if you do the calculation in 2,2, two, two, it does not go to minus 1. There is not a um, duality there because it does not have the same kind of behavior for these intermediate values of R. So you actually do a calculation where you could see that doing strong coupling super Yang Mills, comparing that to the weak coupling supergravity calculation, that you can extract a match between the expected behaviors for this correlator. And doing that calculation within the, the supersymmetric DLCQ approach. This may be somewhat technical, but I mean, some of these supersymmetric theories have moduli spaces. Do, what do you do with that? I mean, you, usually in two dimensions, you do have to worry about some kind of wave function on the moduli space, no? In lower, sufficiently low dimensions. That is, you're not actually sitting, you know, in a particular bed. Oh. Oh, the wave function, the ground, there's a ground state wave function of some sort. Well, remember, we're doing this on the light front, and so the, the vacuum is, is trivial. And there are, there are, <laughs> and there, there, there are arguments that the, the zero modes, in this case, for a supersymmetric calculation, that the zero modes are decoupled, that they don't uh, enter into the calculation. Now, more recently, we've been doing calculations not using DLCQ, but instead using function expansions. And depending on what you're doing, um, that would either involve that you have Fox state wave functions, so you're expanding your state in terms of some set of Fox states, just uh, generically writing it with a label n, but of course you'd be summing over numbers of particles and momenta and so on, and you have wave functions associated with uh, the different uh, Fox sectors. Now these functions, you can imagine expanding in some basis, and the reason you might want to do that is for DLCQ, you're forced to resolve things according to a particular scale. Now, what happens for the light front is that this thing is always positive. Okay, even when PZ goes negative, E is always big enough to make this whole thing positive. And so you're always working at fixed, uh, a fixed P, total P plus, which defines an integer traditionally called capital K such that when you come over to here, this whole thing is independent of the box size. And instead, the limit that you want to consider is, is k going to infinity. And that um, back here corresponds to taking the box size to infinity as well at fixed p plus. So the way the calculations are done is that this ratio of an individual momentum to the total momentum is always being controlled by just this ratio of integers, which means that this capital K sets the resolution of the calculation. And if you need to know what this wave function looks like close to 0 or 1 in this ratio, you've got to take K really large to be able to see that. But DLCQ forces you to use 
k points within the representation of this function. And so if you're doing a calculation where the function is varying very rapidly at, say, 0 and also near 1, and you're dividing it up into 1 over k segments, the computer spends a lot of time dealing with this where there's nothing going on. And it's more useful to look at doing basis function expansions that instead let you represent things more carefully in the regions that are important and not worry so much about the interior. So we've been looking at using basis function calculations in order to um, take that into account. And that sort of approach has been uh, particularly pursued by James Very and collaborators at Iowa State. And they have uh, an acronym, which I always get transposed. I always have to look it up every time for some reason. Uh, basis light front quantization. And this thing is actually a, a hybrid where they're using DLCQ in the longitudinal, and they're using basis functions in the transverse. So representing the transverse dependence of this function is in terms of summing over either oscillator states or they also use the holographic QCD um, states that come from the, that kind of modeling that's going on. And DLCQ is used in the longitudinal direction, which is what I was describing here. And they've been doing some very large Lanczos calculations. Uh, James has a parallel Lanczos code originally developed for nuclear physics calculations and many-body calculations. Um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to mention is about Fox space truncation. There are a couple different ways to try to deal with this, but what it, um, one of the key problems has to do with looking at this combination of diagrams, which would enter into the lowest order uh, word identity for a gauge theory. If your cutoff at, in the Fox space is to include only one gauge particle, then this and this are gone, and you're left with only this. And so you have violations of the Ward identity. You have violations of the cancellations that should take place between the infinities that are associated with these, which is another way of saying you've lost the Ward identity. Um, and the other aspect that comes into all this is that if you think about a situation like this versus a situation like this, when you're doing a calculation, this self-energy is going to be different from this self-energy because you're going to take into account this additional spectator in the structure uh, of this contribution. And here, there's no spectator. So you get what are called sector-dependent self-energies. Now, one way that people have tried to get around this, originally proposed by Ken Wilson, is that you have sector-dependent parameters in the Lagrangian. So you make the bare mass and you make the bare coupling dependent on which Fox sector you're dealing with. And you tune those in order to cancel out these issues so they go away. You sweep them in. Turns out that when you do that in, for the coupling, it makes the wave functions ill-defined. Now, that's kind of a technicality. I wasn't going to get into the details of that. But uh, adjusting the mass is OK. And we've done some calculations that way. But adjusting the coupling to make this work uh, leads to all sorts of problems uh, having to do with the normalization of the wave functions. Because you're basically converting wave function renormalization over to coupling renormalization, and it uh, 
becomes a, quite a mess. Our alternative for this is something called. I'm not sure I need to put this there. Hmm? Yes? You know, it's clear in any case that we are not supposed to truncate to just one gluon or two gluons in a realistic calculation. And well, if you don't yes, truncate to just one or two, but if you truncate to a hundred, then is it clear that this problem you, you is still have, going to go away? You still have the problem at the top sector as far as the uncancelled divergences are concerned. But those should and somehow you know, be taken into account by all the other normalization procedures and so on. And the limit it, should exist. Yeah, is it just an issue of not being able to take the limit properly yeah. and then you try to like... It, well, it, it's how, how you're going to define yeah. doing that limit. The, these renormalization procedures you're talking about are what get very messy as far as how you're actually going to handle that. And of course, you can't do it with 100. It's got to be some much smaller number. And so it really does have an effect. This sec and the sector dependence, of course, propagates all the way down because each time you go to a lower sector, you get a more and more complicated self-energy correction that could happen. But just to and notice so that at fixed time, you never have to do this trick. You don't adjust. You do renormalization at fixed time, quantization. You do it once for your Hamiltonian, and you use the same Hamiltonian in all sectors, and it works without any extra tricks. But when you truncate Fox space, what yeah, do you do you with the uncanceled? You truncate it in a truncated Fox space. So, so in that case, when you take, when you are able to, to take the, the truncation high enough, you don't see any pathologies which you need to fix. By if, if, you, if you can take the truncation high enough, yes. Yeah. Right. We're looking at situations where the calculation is so complicated that you can't get to that regime, okay, where you could just say that they're okay, they're, they're pushed away. Well, let's take phi to the fourth, which is a very simple uh, theory. You know, in that case, do you have to do any dirty tricks like that? Or, I mean, sorry that I'm calling five, five, four, five, four and one plus one? No, yeah, of course not. Of course not. No. But QED, some people in the Lycon community still report results for the one photon, two photon truncations. I mean, so very yeah, yeah. So uh, the in light front calculations that have been done, these are on very small truncations because in 3 plus 1 you get um, all your transverse degrees of freedom and everything else. The calculation gets very huge very quickly. Um, so things have been kept at a low level. But of course, in one plus one, these issues don't come up. Um, but is there value to such calculations? It's as a starting point, yes, of course, to try to understand what's going on. Yeah. So, I mean, if, you, if your theory is weakly coupled, then you just do perturbation. If it's strongly coupled, then how can you hope that truncating to two gluons or two photons, you will get anything which resembles the realistic situation? So what, how is this a starting point? It's like, it seems to be very... Well, I think the, I agree, I agree. And this, what I'm about to describe uh, gets around that. But the, um, the general attitude has been, I get into arguments with people about this, but um, and I don't mean I'm with you, I mean with people in the life run community, <laughs> that the, the, the idea has been that there's some intermediate region where you can do calculations that you can make some sense of that are just beyond what perturbation theory can do. Uh, and so you can see what's going on in the theory to some extent. But of course, you can't do a full, um, really strong coupling calculation without being able to bring in many fields. We have a method that we call the light front coupled cluster method, um, LFCC for short. Sophia will talk about an application in 5.4 uh, in the next talk. Basic idea of this method is to take technology that's used in many body calculations where it's called a couple, couple cluster method and the name makes a little bit more sense. Um, but basically, you look for a solution written in this form where this phi 
is some base state. If you're talking about a proton, it might be your three quark state. Um, if you're talking about 5, 4, and you're, you're looking at the uh, odd states, this would be the, the one constituent state, so just the A dagger on the vacuum. Anyway, anyway it's, it's something that is a very relatively simple thing. Uh, there might be a wave function associated with it, but it's still relatively simple. But it has the right quantum numbers for what you're trying to calculate. The square root of z is just something that maintains normalization, so both the psi and phi have the same uh, normalization. This t is the key to the whole thing. This operator t creates particles. And it might create only one or might create two, but in any case, the exponentiation of it, of course, introduces all the higher powers of t. And so this thing includes all the Fox states. So we don't do a Fox state truncation at all. Instead, what we do is we truncate t. We look at making approximations to this operator t, keeping just a few simple forms. If you're doing QCD, th that would correspond to a uh, gluon bifurcation type situation. So you have one gluon going to two, so you get a particle increase. You have uh, gluon emission by a quark, and you would have gluon doing pair production. <coughs> so your initial for QCD, your lowest order approximation to this operator T would be involve these three things. And they increase particle number, they take your three quark state here to a state that has, um, you need this, this would have to happen first, so you, uh, I'm sorry, this would have to happen first to produce a gluon, and then when it acts again, you would pick up two gluons and so on. So this would generate all the Fox states in QCD. Sorry, is T bilinear in the creation of annihilation? I, I, like it, it would involve one annihil in these cases, it would involve one annihilation and two creation operators. And a function that says how the momentum is divided between them, an unknown function. So you'd have three different functions here for these three different types of vertices that would appear in T, which would be a sum of these three things. And then you get all the possible combinations that would happen when you take powers of T acting on this. So you would have no Fox space truncation, and there are three functions to be determined in order to find this state. And there's a fourth function, it's the wave function of your three quark state that's sitting here. So you feed this into... This is a sort of ansatz. Yes, and it's exact as long as you keep all possible t, an infinite number of functions. But you're assuming that higher Fox states in your exact wave function are correlated with the low occupation number states in a particular way, which is exponential. When you make the truncation, yeah. yes, now there are, there are connections. In practice, you do. So yes. Yes. once you truncate to, let's say, just yeah. the stick diagrams, yeah. um, <coughs> is there a physics reason to expect that, that this should be a good approximation? In, in a stronger couple situation. Oh, well, whether or not it's a good approximation for QCD is an open question. We've checked it within some simpler theories, and it, it looks reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what you then have is, from your original calculation, You have then instead an effective interaction, an effective Hamiltonian, which is a transformation of the original Hamiltonian according to this function t. And if you project this now onto the valence state, then that gives you a, an equation that determines the, this function, uh, the wave function that's buried inside this state. And if you make a projection onto all the higher Fox states, this right-hand side becomes zero, and you get equations for the functions that are in T. Uh, 
and they are nonlinear functions. And if you linearize them, if you expand them out, that then reproduces a subset of diagrams to all orders. So this process resums, uh, does a partial resummation of perturbation theory to all orders. So we're keeping all the, the Fox states. So and the other thing that happens is that these self-energy contributions are the same in, in all the sectors. They will involve one of these functions from that T operator on one of the at least one of the vertices on one of the vertices, but they become independent of any spectators um, that are going by at the same time. So can this be thought of as some like coherent state basis for the Fox state? This is a, a generalization of a coherent state, basically. If you look at, because of the structure of T, um, you have one or more annihilation operators and then at least one more than that of creation operators. So it, it sort of looks like a coherent state in some sense, but it's not quite the same thing. But it's the same in some, uh, it's a generalization of it. And in looking at testing this idea in a simpler theory, we happen to have picked 5, 4 and 1 plus 1 as one of the places to do that. And in doing that, we found ourselves looking at issues associated with the critical coupling and all that and uh, came across very nice work that Slava and collaborators have done and that uh, now some of the rest of you have also done. Um, and that's the, really the topic of the next talk. Um, but that's how we arrived at doing that, um, bringing me back to 5.4 again, looking at it from a, a different perspective. Um, last thing I wanted to comment about, I've already said a few things, and that's about the vacuum and zero modes. Um, most recently, the thing that we've been looking at is a parameterization that's due to Kent Hornbostel. Um, where you define a set of coordinates, C is not the speed of light, C is just a parameter, uh, signs right here, where C going to 1 would correspond to an equal time calculation and C going to 0 would correspond to a light front calculation. So we can set up the Hamiltonian problem with respect to these coordinates and look at what happens. We do the calculation in equal time and do the calculation in the limit as this parameter C goes to zero, which then approaches the light front to see what happens in order to try to understand how things map over from one calculation to the other. Now I don't have time to get into the details of how that works. But here is a calculation done. Can you I got to get to that. Uh, you mentioned the name, but this is, yeah, you have a reference which you should look at. Yeah, this is Kent Hornbostel. And it really goes back a long way. It's Visrev D, volume 45, 3781, from 1992. And Others have worked with this uh, as well. It's uh, not nearly a complete reference, but I think that's one of the that's really one of the earliest appearances of doing this sort of thing. Now this isn't five four. This is a free scalar that's just been shifted by a constant, and this is what the spectrum looks like. And there is one state, which is a coherent state. The eigen, it's actually an exact eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And that has uh, rescaled by some factors, gives you this minus 1, which is independent of C. So as you, the equal time calculation is way over here. The light front calculation way over here. 
and in between it's C independent. The state itself reverts to the trivial vacuum in the limit as C goes to zero. But everywhere in between, it's a coherent state that is basically the unitary transformation that shifts the field back to where it belongs. <laughs> and as you approach the light front, all the excited states in the calculation blow up because they're going like 1 over square root of C, because zero modes make a contribution that goes like 1 over the square root of C to the light front energy. So they all blow up except for this one, so you retain that vacuum. And this sort of example made us think, well, maybe if you do a calculation in 5.4, you could see what the vacuum is supposed to look like when you get over to the light front. Um, but it doesn't quite work. Here is a calculation at C equals 1 that is roughly comparable to the calculation that Slava has done um, with the same, same sort of cutoffs um, and with the variation here is in how many different um, modes you include in the calculation up to, all the way up to having 20 constituents. This is 5-4. This, so this is the vacuum in the even sector. And it can do the subtracted spectrum, you know, these, this is again at C equals 1. But if you look at difference C, and you get the same sort of plot for the difference as C is changing from 1 towards 0. As it goes towards 0 on the left, it goes farther and farther up. Um, but you still get this degeneracy between the even and the odd lowest states happening at approximately the same uh, place. So it's qualitatively consistent with the uh, equal time result for the critical coupling. The problem is that if you look at what's actually happening to the lowest state as a function of C at particular choices of the coupling, is that it's going as C equals zero is way off at infinity to the right. These are all going down, okay? And they're all headed to minus infinity. And one can see that in the calculation just looking at a simple vacuum bubble that is a contribution to this. If you calculate this thing in these coordinates, this represents an energy shift that goes like 1 over C to the 3 halves. So as C goes to 0, the vacuum bubbles drive that even vacuum state in equal time is driven down to minus infinity. And so you can't take this calculation and graft it onto a light front calculation and understand the vacuum. Instead, you would have to do a calculation entirely within these C-dependent coordinates and look at only differences, just as we did, as we do here. You know, this is looking at a difference. Everything's fine, even though as C goes to zero, um, things are, are blowing up for the individual states. The difference remains stable. So we'd have to do all the calculations within this coordinate system and look at the limit for those calculations rather than being able to do a vacuum calculation in these coordinates and add that to a light front calculation in the other. And uh, so we're... Uh, Still thinking about the vacuum uh, and what, how to incorporate it. Pardon? Is this unpublished yet? This is unpublished. This is, um, and in fact, the toner is still wet on this. Uh, these plots. This is just done within the last couple weeks. And I've already, um, so we're already looking at other possibilities for trying to understand the, the vacuum in zero modes. And this is something that has. The trivial vacuum of the light front has been always talked about as being an advantage to doing light front calculations. You don't have to bother calculating the vacuum. <laughs> well, as we all know from this meeting, this workshop, the vacuum is important and trying to understand what's going on with respect to critical coupling in 5.4. You need to understand the vacuum, and so to do a calculation on the light front is non-trivial. And the next talk will uh, get into some of those issues as far as what can you do in the light front before you truly, truly understand what's going on with the vacuum in all its respects. <laughs>
Um, so let me conclude that we've tried to indicate how we've looked at these different aspects that enter into trying to do a calculation that would lead to being able to do QCD at least within some range of uh, the physics. We could, for example, look at relatively simple, relatively simple calculations for a heavy quark system or glue ball systems within a quenched version of the theory. So you don't have any light quarks running around. Uh, James Berry has been looking at doing uh, that type of heavy quark calculation, not within our formulation, but um, within their own way of approaching things as far as the regularization and the um, discretization is concerned. So there, there's certainly some work being done already in, in that direction on, on QCD. Uh, thank you for your attention, and thanks for having us here. We have time for questions. In the regularization that you described at the beginning, have you done perturbative checks of this? I, uh, it was hard for me to follow exactly everything. Have you done perturbative checks? Within the context of QED, yes. In, you haven't done the full non-abelian, non no. We've, we've put together the, the formalism and gotten to work out the, the, how the BRST has to work, how the ghost fields would have to be there, but we've not done a, a calculation. Oh, no, that's me, sorry. Uh, uh, we've not done a, a, a calculation in, in perturbation theory, which would be a, a nice thing to do to check how this is, could work. Yeah. In this slide, you still have up, so you're calculating the ground state energy, and in the limit that C goes to zero, this is a light cone. You, it's the light cone limit. So, what's the reason it's not becoming trivial in that limit? You're sort of doing a light cone limit like one calculation where you're not getting zero vacuum energy? Well, you see, there are no, in the naive light front formulation, there are no vacuum bubbles. So basically what this is telling you is that they're going away somewhere and um, they're just not there on the light front. So what's the reason why if you just take What's different about your C goes to zero formulation that, so it's not quite a light cone calculation because you're not getting zero, zero vacuum energy. So just what's, how should I think about how that's different from how you, how should I think about how that's different from a standard light cone calculation or would be zero? Oh, because as long as C is not zero, um, or you, uh, as long as C is not zero, you have ordinary, uh, canonical quantization uh, rather than a light front quantization. And so everything goes through in the normal sort of way and, and you have a vacuum, you've got tadpole contributions, you've got vacuum bubbles, all that stuff is there, all the, it's all there. Um, it's just that instead of giving us something that there's that for which there's some residue when you get some finite residue when you arrive at the light front, instead it, it's it's infinite, and so it, it just has to be thrown away um, from this when you're taking this kind of limit. And, or to put it a more positive way, if you, you could try to simulate a light front calculation by doing the calculation at finite C and taking the limit as C goes to zero and only consider energy differences. Yeah, I think I think this check is very very instructive and very interesting. It would be interesting to see when all the details when they come out. But just to understand the way this computation is organized, you cannot really describe. So when you really have to compute individually each one of these points, so there is no simple rule which tells you that okay, if you compute something at c equal you know one which is the left side of your plot, and then you can predict basically all these points automatically. You really have to do an independent computation, because the truncation somehow breaks Lorentz invariance. Is that my, my interpretation? Well, in fact, the way the calculation is done here is that this, the states that were kept at C equals 1 yeah. are kept all the way through. 
So we don't do a, an energy cutoff that varies with C, right? The, 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 the determination of the Fock basis is made at C equals 1 with the cutoff in energy in the way you do it, okay? okay. And then... So what I'm trying to understand, okay, of course, if we were to do exact calculation, then all these points would be rela related by Lorentz invariance. But, you know, if, in mm. order for this to be a, an independent check, uh, it really has to be done in presence of a cutoff, which breaks this correspondence. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, I don't see how it's... Well, the, you have to remember that the... The energies associated with zero modes are, they blow up as one over the square root of C. And modes associated with negative momentum blow up as one over C. Okay. And because of that, if you invo invoke an energy cutoff, you'd be constantly removing states as you go to C equals zero. And eventually you'd reach a point at some val finite value of C where the only thing there's nothing left but the trivial vacuum. That might be an answer to your question there. It's another way of looking at it. When you impose an energy cutoff, yeah, the cutoff should be if, if, you, if you impose an energy cutoff that remains applied to the states as computed at a particular value of C, then eventually all the states are removed okay. and there's nothing left but the trivial vacuum. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Yeah, wait, you see might. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's thank John again.